It's bad, okay? 3-7-1 and one is bad. Worst defensive metrics across the board, across the league, that's bad. What I want to know is how bad. Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way. Bright and early every weekday, if you're into football and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. The Penguins take on the Ducks tonight at PPG Paints Arena. That's a 7.08 p.m. face-off, and it'll be yet another opportunity for the home team to at least start the process of turning things around. Some of them, a couple nights ago, including Mike Sullivan, I should add, felt that they had maybe possibly started it in the 5-3 to three loss to the Wild. I'm not buying that. I still saw odd man breaks. I still saw breakaways. I saw Matt Grizzly out there handing a goal away. I saw long, ugly loops and circles in the defensive zone instead of hard skate stops, you know, playoff type skate stops, lots of spray. And if that's progress, then that tells you an awful lot about where they were through Western Canada. Nothing really changed. Neither did the remarks afterward. Listen to Sidney Crosby after that game the other night when asked about the state of the team. I think we're just we're giving up too much. You know, I can't can't win consistently, and you know when you give up, you know the quality of chances or the amount of goals that we're giving up. So you know we gotta we gotta find a way to limit our mistakes, and you know if we're gonna make them, they can't be big ones. Didn't sound any different than Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and that's because it didn't look much different. But and you knew I was gonna throw a butt into this. The part that gets me is that if you look intensely, and I know this wouldn't be much fun, so I wouldn't recommend it, into these six games in a row now that the Penguins have lost, the weirdest conceivable statistic rises up out of those. And that's that the Penguins, for the season, lead the NHL in high-danger scoring chances created. And unlike last season, when they had a bunch of those as well and just couldn't convert, they're converting. If you go over these past few games, you're going to see goals. Not tons of them, but plenty enough to win. Also, unlike last season, if you look at the power play, which, of course, was a historic failure in 2023-24, it's now at around 16%, and it's it's looking still like the one that had some people, myself included, encouraged all through training camp in the preseason. They're still doing it. It's not as religious as it was at the start of the season, but they're still doing the right things for the most part. They're doing the stuff that they had discussed, moving the puck around quickly, shooting it more often attempting plays off the rush instead of just gaining the zone and setting up. All of that's still in play, and it's way, way better than it was. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your summer sports needs this season, from Major League Baseball, golf, NHL, NBA playoffs. Get the latest odds and lines, including all team matchups, player props, odds on just about everything that's out there. Head to the website today. Or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. Also, unlike last season, there's bottom six scoring. In fact, there's been more bottom six scoring through these 11 games than I could recall like through all 82 last year. I know that's exaggerating, but that's how it feels. And I still think that you're going to see goals out of Yessi Puliyarvi, Cody Glass, Valtteri Pustinen got one the other night. Know why? Because he shot the puck. He's now, by the way, shooting at a 100% clip for the season. So it seems to me that there's a part of this that's working to the point where you wonder why it isn't having more of an effect on the overall process. Throw in now, again, this is just my view, 
that the goaltending has been better than it was. At least if you take out those early Tristan Jari appearances, which as management obviously agrees from their resulting actions, weren't anywhere near NHL caliber. And you've got now, stay with me, you've got some scoring. You've got making the most of your attack zone time. You've got a power play, at least a better one. You've got scoring depth. And you've got some kind of stability at the most important position. Oh, no. What have we singled out again? That's right. That's right. That was the point of the entire segment. How did you not see this coming? I, I, I don't like to oversimplify team sports, but you're talking about six defensemen, half of whom aren't performing anywhere near where they should, and the other half who don't even belong in the league. When we come back, J1Q. Q comes from Matt, who says, DK, the knives are clearly out for Mike Sullivan among the fan base, but to me, Sullivan is just trying to work with the team that's been provided to him by Kyle Dubas, so maybe the knives should be out for him. He signed Ryan Graves, Tristan Jari, Matt Grizzlick to big contracts that are essentially now wasted cap space, taking the Penguins to the ceiling with no options. How does Dubas get out of of the mess that he created, are we seeing another Ron Hextall in the GM's job? Uh, first thing I would do here, Matt, in responding is to take Grizzly out of the big contracts category that you put him in. I think it's a lousy contract because I don't think he's much of a player. But one year at $2.75 million shouldn't be thrown into the same category with a six-year and a five-year as were given to Graves and to Jari. My thinking on why Dubas doesn't get the same criticism or anywhere near the same criticism from the fan base as Sullivan does is twofold. One, he's not the guy you see on TV during the games that they're losing. You see Sullivan, you shake your fist, he's right there. Dubas is up in a press box somewhere, not going to be on camera very often. Two, Dubas is new. Sullivan's been here for a long time, and it seems like it's almost been as long a time since he's overseen a playoff series. So he's not only the face, but also the voice that everyone's getting tired of. And I'm actually going to throw in a third one here. I liked Dubas' summer. I really didn't like the one last year. I did this year. I felt like his main initiatives should have been to bolster the bottom six He did that, and to get the roster and the organization younger. He really did that. Unfortunately, none of that's going to play on the ice in Pittsburgh for a while. If he made a mistake, and I think it's becoming increasingly obvious that he did, it's that he thought the defense was going to be fine. I don't know how else to interpret that. Sure, you know that you have a lot of money that goes to Eric Carlson, the team's highest paid player, and to Chris Letang. And you know, and you've said publicly, that you want to keep Marcus Pedersen for the long-term future, even though he's on an expiring contract year. But you're stuck with Graves. Your only other edge guys are, are two younger ones in Jack St. Ivany and Ryan Shea. And your only external move is Grizzlick, and you misjudged him Obviously, by such a broad margin that he entered camp on the top pairing. And by the way, showed almost instantly before there were even preseason games that he had no business being in that position. I'm going to state this plainly, and I hope it resonates. The best defenseman that the Penguins had in camp in terms of poise, performance, everything, was Harrison Brunicki, the rookie the 18-year-old. And I get why he goes back to juniors and everything, and I'm not about to retro-criticize that move. It's really, really hard to break into the NHL at that position at age 18, okay? But if he were still here, he'd still be this team's best defenseman. 
And I don't doubt that for even a split second. That's how good he was. And as long as I'm at it, I really didn't like letting John Ludwig walk. He's now made it into the Avalanche's lineup. And Jared Bednar, the coach in Denver, made some strong public remarks about the way Ludwig has shown up out there. Left-handed defenseman who can get it done at both ends of the rink and is not just willing but eager to drop the gloves and stick up for his teammates and be physical and everything, and he's just casually discarded? Why? Why? This this is why, to, to, to go back to what you're saying, I feel like Dubas had a good summer up to this point, meaning up to the point of satisfactorily addressing the blue line. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. Again, I'm heading to the arena tonight to cover Penguins versus Ducks. I'll have a full column about it on DK Pittsburgh Sports, and we'll be back with another one of these tomorrow. Tomorrow.